Hello, thanks for tuning in. So joining us for this talk, um, which will be hosted by Imaging Clinetting, that's me from Artsite Inc. I'm the programming coordinator here at Windsor's Artist Run Center. Um, and we're very grateful to welcome Lorna Mills. So thank you so much, Lorna, for joining us for Option Shift. So Artsite is an artist run center in Windsor, Ontario, dedicated to showcasing contemporary art within the Windsor Essex region. We are excited to be continuing, continuing Option Plus Shift, which is our new series of online talks featuring digital artists and curators. Um, this work showcases some of the diverse conversations and perspectives being explored through digital media today. Through this, this series of talks, we hope to not only broaden our understanding of the digital medium, but also become exposed to different ways of working digitally, which have become even more prevalent in our current COVID reality. Digital media has become a way for us to bring bridge social ga distance gaps, continue working remotely while still creating unique work through experimental and unconventional ways. And by talking about their respective practices, we hope these speakers will help us think even more expansively about what digital practices look like. Again, we're excited to welcome Lorna Mills. Lorna Mills has actively exhibited her work in both solo and group exhibitions since the early 1990s, both in Canada and internationally. Her practice has included obsessive ifochrome printing, obsessive painting, obsessive Super 8 film and video, and obsessive online animated GIFs incorporating, incorporated into restrained offline installation work. She has also co-curated monthly GIF projections with Rhea McNamara for the Shoros performance series in Toronto, and most recently, well, not, well now dot what the fuck, a sprawling net art project co-curated by Faith Holland and Wade Wallerstein. Um, before we jump in, I would like to do a land acknowledgement and then I'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we wish to express our gratitude and acknowledge that our work today takes place on traditional Indigenous territories across Ontario. Artsite is located on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And that through these online platforms, we are able to hold conversations with guests across other cities, including to Toronto or Toronto, which is the ancestral traditional territories of the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabeg, and the Michi Minnesota, and the, sorry, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. We would also like to recognize that the, that an acknowledgement is just an acknowledgement and is not an act, act of reconciliation or decolonization in itself. This should prompt us as settlers to think about our responsibilities to this land, as well as our relationships to Indigenous groups who continue to face violence, erasure, and displacement by the legacy of colonialism, which we as settlers benefit from. This includes us at Artsite as we try to make long-term changes towards more equitable programming, which includes making space for more Indigenous, Black, and intersectional perspectives. Okay, so thank you all for joining us again. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Lorna in just a second. Um, during you know, the first part of the conversation, if you ever want to uh, jump in or ask a question, um, everyone is muted at the moment, but if you would like to type a question into the chat window, um, you'll see at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's a button that says chat. You can click on that, open up your chat, then you have access to the chat window and you can either type out a question and I will read it for you, or in all caps, like just say question or I have a question and I will unmute you and you can ask your question directly. That would also be very fun. We are down to do either. Um, okay, cool. That's it for me. Lorna, passing it off to you. Thank you again for being here. This is amazing. Like you're passing what on to me? <laughs> oh, right. We're just having a conversation. <laughs> right. I wasn't doing a presentation. I was right. except for awesome Zoom backgrounds. And we're going to slowly work our way to the porn. Just gonna okay. everyone and 
Sounds good. Sounds good. Sorry about that. I just got, guess I got so into my um, like professional introduction. I was like, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, cool. Uh, so I guess I can start it off then because I have some questions prepared uh, for Lorna um, just to, you know, warm us up a bit. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Okay. Lorna, could you tell us about your experience curating Well Now WTF? How curating for slash on a digital platform differs from curating a physical space? Uh, do you see different opportunities, different limitations? Um, yeah, what did that what, what did that process look like for you? Well, obviously there's limitations as far as taking digital work or work and putting it online or vice versa. Every artist has their own tricks, uh, their own strategies. Mm -hmm. But when you're doing a large group show, you have to create a framework for it and so that you can deal with the logistics. And um, that was actually done. I, this was a show that was co-curated with Faith Holland and um, Wade Wallerstein and Kalani Nicole did the um, the interface for us and you know did the design and and you know did the coding because none of us wanted to do it. Um, <laughs> you know, all these net artists we just couldn't be bothered. Uh, net. Um, so I mean the experience of doing that we came we gave ourselves such a ridiculously short deadline. To get it done, it was literally you know the start of doc uh, uh, at the start of the um, um, lockdown. Uh, Faith came along and said, "I want to do a a net show, net art show." So um, we got. Uh, I said, "Yes, I'll do it with her," and we got Wade Wallerstein on board because he's really young, and we figured he'd do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's all I think about is, you know, how get someone to do the work. Um, so, um, I mean, the experience of that was because there was three of us at co-curating, it made a difference in who you invite. There's three people, you know, giving their, um, their thoughts on it and suggesting people. And we decided very early on it was going to be the more, the merrier. Mm -hmm. like, it didn't matter if it was a clusterfuck or not. It was just like the more people, the better. And um, so what happens in that situation is that with three curators, you're going to find out about artists that you never knew about and you know never would have considered because you just didn't know their work. So it's a wonderful way to work, you know, to co-work with uh, people, uh, which you know broadens you know my horizons for what's out there because there's a lot of really, really young artists in this show. Yeah, there was lots of artists in that show who, you know, I had never heard about their work. I'd never discovered their work until that exhibition. Um, and what I kind of liked about the show, too, was that it was very um, exploratory, I guess, just because of the way that you are um, exploring different rooms and different sort of like subsets of the work. Um, is that a, a decision that you came to curatorially? Curatorial. Yeah, it was a conscious decision. It was uh, just, well, how it worked out was that we we're trying to come up with a name for mm -hmm. the show because to me, that's the most important thing. Can't do anything until we have a name for something. Yeah. <laughs> and um, as, as the names kept on coming in, it was like very snarky and, and, and you know, kind of like dark. Um, it, it came to like, well, we can use all these names. We can, you know, separate into rooms because for mm -hmm. me, it's important to know what something's gonna look like or to have a basic structure. And so when we structured it as rooms, like, you know, early internet, um, that made it a lot easier and we could use every damn title that uh, we had thought up. So that, that, that was, you know, how that came about. Yeah, I just, I really, um, yeah, I really enjoyed that just as a viewer and also the fact that it, it does draw from sort of, uh, early internet and um just sort of like doubles down on the medium like yeah this is online this is not an offline exhibition they're very different from one another they operate in different ways well there's also it's a very it's, it's a uh, a show that's dedicated to the pictorial as well because there is a lot of there's a lot of online practices net art practices that we you know, couldn't include you know from creative coders uh people who you know, like to subvert the actual website 
um, we couldn't include them. Uh, so I, ha I have to you know, say that it does have its limitations in terms of practice, mm. um, you know, which is fine because you can't do everything. It was just you know, a decision we made so that we had some kind of structure. For sure. And so that we could get the show out fast. For some reason, like we wanted it out fast and it turned out to be the right time. Oh yeah, like when that show was coming together, I was just like, oh my gosh, we're still in, you know, I mean, we're still all in crisis mode and there's this thing that we, that we can, you know, explore and enjoy. And like, yeah, that was just, I think, uh, really, um, it was important for me anyway. So I'm oh. sure a lot of people really enjoyed that. Uh, yeah, I'm still kind of interested too in the, in if there's anything you could say that where your curatorial process differs between um, online and physical, if there's, yeah. Oh. Um, well, seems like all the cur curating I've done has been both. Hmm. So um, it's, you know, it's, I can't, I mean, obviously, there's obvious differences, and you've got to think about things like playback and presentation. But those are things I personally, I generally work out first because I know it's going to be online and offline. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of artists, you know, are, 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 I think in the early days of net art, when these people started getting uh, gallery shows under the uh, umbrella of post internet, then they, people started trying to come up with devices to use in order to you know, either replicate the, the um, experience or uh, somehow magnify it. Mm. But you know, it's different from every artist and so much of it is like enlightened consumerism. <laughs> it really is, you're thinking about, well, what consumer products you know, can I find to present this work? You know, how, ma how many laptops can I get? Maybe you know, it's better to go to video from this, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, how how like crisp and you know how like visually appealing can I make something look is also sort of a little bit capitalist too. No, I think that's you know art has to be interesting to look at. Yeah, fair fair enough. <laughs> I want to call everything capitalist because <laughs> we live in <laughs> the world. So. Um, uh, okay, um, the next question. Okay, you use the word obsessive to describe different parts of your practice. You've been quoted always working when I'm offline, when I'm online, sorry. Could you describe what obsessive means to you and why it's such a central element of your work? Do you see that intersecting with phone slash internet addiction, burnout? Um, personally, there's no burnout or phone addiction because I hate my telephone. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I have a 42 inch screen at home. So yeah, this is, it's fabulous. Um, by obsessed by mean I'm extremely focused and all through my well career, all through my practice over the years, everything I've done, I've done it like it's the only thing I know how to do. So no matter what medium, it was like this is all I have. <laughs> so there's like there's this desperation in there. I gotta make this work. Uh, and so I mean that's how I do stuff. And I mean online, even when I'm in um dicking around on social media. I'm recording stuff, screen capturing stuff that I can turn into gifts, whatever. And, you know, I'm just looking for gifts generally. So, you know, it's, I'm always working. And I've also set up my studio and my life in a way that it's really, it's the easiest thing on earth for me to do is to start working when I wake up. Um, I mean, with in other mediums, it was always like, oh God, I gotta find the paint. Where's my stand? Or oh, I gotta go pick up some brushes. I gotta do this. Gotta do that. And you know, this with digital art, it's, I've got a, this tiny, perfect universe. And um, but with that feeling, also comes like a feeling, like a nagging feeling of just severe limitations. And but I think that's part of any mature artist has has figured out that they can't make all the art in the world. You know, it's like your stuff isn't going to cover everything. And I think curating, you know, takes that, takes those feelings away because then I can, you know, I can present stuff that I think is wonderful that I could never do in a million years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
that's very insightful. I've been feeling kind of a similar thing as an artist too. I think, you know, the, the, um, the things are so up in the air right now. And it's like, oh my gosh, how do you even make art when everything is so like dire? Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, I guess if you're making work online and um, sort of like s scrolling and scouring and capturing, but then you're also encountering this, like, I don't know, like the news and advertisement, like how do you keep yourself like, committed to your, to your craft, I guess. Um, and yeah. <laughs> I just think of it as like all information coming in is yeah. getting processed in some way. Mm. So it, it's not like there's distract, the only distractions for me would be like stupid repetitive games that I sometimes play that are just kind of embarrassing because they're not even cool. And I used to program games, children's games, um, years ago. I guess well, I started in uh, the 90s and up until a few years ago, I, I worked constantly programming games, and, but I never played them unless I was paid. So I did yeah, I don't really like playing games when it comes right down to it. And I think someone once mentioned in, in at a studio I was working in, they, they, they said, not only do you not play games, you seem to have contempt for people who do. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're crazy. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's interesting. But you used to like produce, like program games though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, okay. Do you find your experience in other art forms comes into play in your digital work? Oh, absolutely. Because I was trained as a painter like a million years ago. So, I mean, hence, you know, I'm devoted to the pictorial and mm -hmm. I use colors uh, in specific ways that are, are more painterly. And I, I do care that things are interesting to look at. So yeah, de definitely. And also in the formalities and in how I compose the screen, it's, it, it's painterly. It is, it is for sure. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so, and how, how long does it take you to like produce a, a con like normally, or is it just very different in case by case? Well, yeah, production, I, I kind of do things in it like, almost like it's an assembly line. So I, um, I'm collecting the gifts constantly, and then I'm doing something where I'm cutting the gifts. So I'm taking in the individual elements, because these are all from, you know, different gifts, and cutting out stuff, and then that goes in a folder. And um, when it's time to make a work, and it generally has to do with deadlines. Otherwise, I'm happily cutting gifts forever. It's like labor intensive, boring as hell, and I watch Netflix and, and anything I've downloaded, and Brit TV. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like totally brain dead stuff to do. But I love it because I get, as I'm working on things, I'm getting glimpses of possibilities, but nothing gems. And um, normally now in my life, it's, it's when I have a show coming up or, you know, someone requests a work. Mm -hmm. uh, or a group show, then I can, I, I'm, I've got everything ready, but I can put things together quite quickly. And I do that in Flash because I can output to a, a GIF from Flash and I can also output to um, a movie with every frame being a keyframe. So it ends up being like a GIF, you know, has all the qualities and the jerkiness of a GIF and the sharpness of the movement. Uh, so that's, so it seems like I can work fast, but there's been so much groundwork laid for mm. that. And you know, currently I'm just happily cutting stuff because I want to do, um, I don't want to do another net art show right now. I'm, you know, waiting for, you know, solo exhibitions and things like that that will come up in 2021. So I'm just kind of coiled and working all the time and like ready to spring something on and, I, I, I kind of do like the excitement of having a show coming up and you know, putting something together suddenly. And surprising myself, I had a friend who, artist friend named Carlos Sesta that told me once that he went to the studio every day because he wanted to surprise himself. 
Oh, I really like that. Yeah, so do I. And it, it's true. Like if I if I if I don't surprise myself with you know each new collage, then you know why bother doing it? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a very like euphoric feeling. I think. Mm hmm. Okay, I have a question from Carl George. Carl George. When you were programming games, were you aware of the addictive nature of games slash gaming and the seductive nature of certain graphics, visuals, colors, sounds, like slot machines in a casino? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, that was like part of the job. I was doing educational software for the most part. So it was like about keeping kids engaged and depending on the age group, slapstick. And early on, like in the 90s, um like mid 90s when we were programming just like the game thing was blowing up they were all being delivered on cd-rom at the time um we used to like have meetings like in our meetings discuss and debate whether you give a reward for the wrong answer if giving a, like a eh sound was too much of a reward or what you know, stupid things like that because you're always thinking of rewards and encouragement and engagement and yes it is absolute manipulation um, and was totally aware of that always. Yeah, because that's just become part of the discourse, you know, currently. So it's kind of interesting to think about that having always existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Oh, it's kind of insidious when you think about it. <laughs> oh, it is. Oh, it is. And there were some games I really hated doing once. Um, once when we were doing. By the time we started doing stuff for the internet, um, and it was probably like about 98, 99 that um, I was working in flash games for online consumption. Um, I was really bothered by ch like kitty surveillance. So it really bothered me that um, we, some clients would ask us to collect a lot of data on how the kids were using the game. And it wasn't like general, it was like individual children, how long it took them, how, like, you know, what. And it, it really bothered me that we were surveilling children. I really hated that. Mm. Um, and so there's a follow up to, but the manipulative sounds colors could also be used in good ways, like when they got a math problem, right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, we thought about that all the time was, was, you know, how do you reward, you know, reward them with an animation, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, um, yeah. Wow. And do you think that there was any of that former education that carries through into your art making practice? I would assume that no, I mean, but I don't know. <laughs> yes. Well, no, not the surveillance, obviously. Um, but yeah, this it's slapstick comes into it, it's um, the flatness of it, because we weren't doing 3D games at the time. And because we were working for kids that were so young, we were working with illustrators and um, a lot of uh, classic animations uh, were going in there. So, I mean, my, my, I prefer that stuff to um, 3D rendering. Uh, a lot of 3D rendering is a hard sell for me. Uh, so, I mean, it's the coldness of it I never liked. So, um, yeah, there, there, there's certain attitudes. I mean, but I brought those attitudes, you know, to the gaming. Of so they, yeah. that, that was coming from me in the first place. I'm, um, I I'm guess I'm a little bit interested too in the process of uh, creating digital work and then bringing, into, bringing it into gallery space and something, you know, like a gift that people normally would access online um, and then bringing it into gallery space is there is there like some kind of um, I guess do you think that there's an operation for the viewer in going and seeing something in a gallery that they normally might look at um, online well for me I think I if they can see it online, I owe them a spectacle. If they're going to go into the real, seriously, if they're going into the real world to see something that's, that, that's readily available, why not give them a spectacle? Uh, and I mean, personally, I, I think about installation work and I think about, you know, placement and scale mm -hmm. uh, and what gets emphasized, what gets magnified. And that matters. And like, I, I still, 
this it's the same thing I did when I you know would have a painting show. It's like think about what's the first thing they see when they enter the room. Mm. You know what you know how what's what's the first blast visually. And yeah, I I, I feel strongly about you know respecting an audience and offering something to an audience. It's it's ultimately you know, what artists do, what we do is um, very gregarious. Mm. You know, unless you're a minimalist and passive aggressive, uh, but I, I'm not. So, so there is like you know that that you it's a generosity and a welcoming. You know, I, I want to welcome people into the space mm. and not have an orchid in the corner of an empty space that's activating it. Because I'm I'm not I, that's not my practice. I'm not interested. I don't want to see. I don't want to go to shows like that. Um, but that's not to say, like, when I go on about my own tastes, uh, a friend of mine, Sally McKay, once said, you know, there's room for it on the internet. <laughs> so, you know, why not? Mm. There's plenty of room for, you know, all sorts of practices. Yeah, I love that. And it's so true, you know. Um, okay. Do you, do you ever make 2D works? from the graphic digital work like prints and limited oh. editions or sculptural work or um well i mean i have done sculptural pieces with video and um i have done print work but i don't love print work mm. um and uh so it's it's not a big deal right that i'd much rather if I do have a show, I don't want it of a bunch of prints. I want it, you know, of the TV sets. I want the movement. I want that cacophony. Right. So the and the movement. So the movement is very is uh, absolutely incredibly yes. vital to the work. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sort of and the sort of like uh, the the looping the looping effect of it. Um, seems incredible it seems like very uh prevalent the work like how do you see that sort of that looping as kind of operating um well it operates like well first of all i never i rarely use perfect loops like mm -hmm. they're always jerky and i i want that abrupt yeah. you know rewind to the front and it's something i work with within the setup of of, of a piece um, and within the composition, because I'm, you know, I'm composing negative space, I'm composing positive space, I'm composing in time. And most of the gifts I do are simultaneous, it means everything is happening on the screen at once. This one that's behind me right now is one of the few gifts I've done on timelines, um, just because, you know, it, it made sense. I'm showing with simultaneous things, and it's a different challenge to do that. Uh, but I don't want to be a video artist. I'm not interested that much in long timelines. And I don't do narratives. I, I'm mm -hmm. not a storyteller in that way. I'm not that kind of artist. And so much of my life has been like coming to this point of figuring out what kind of artist I am, mm -hmm. which every artist has to do. You have to like, you know, suddenly Suddenly you'll come onto something, you'll stumble onto, and we all stumble onto it. You'll stumble onto something that you suddenly want to do every day and want to explore all the time. And you know, when that happens um, and you're not bored by it and neither is your audience, it, it's really exciting. And it, it, you suddenly, there are times where you just feel like you're at full power as an artist, which is something I never understood when I was younger because that never happened. It was just flailing around and trying different mediums all the time. Right. How did that happen for you? Like, how did you find this? And is there, what, what is the story? I'm, I'm oh, well, I was um, working on a blog with uh, Sally McKay in, in the heyday of blogs. So in, in the mid 2000s, early to mid 2000s. And she, she was making gifts and people were making gifts then. Um, and they were all gra based, graphic based. So they were, you know, like with graphic programs and paint programs. And I don't like those programs. I, I don't like painting with a computer. Um, <laughs> most of my base like was photographic um, and video based. And 
I, Sally was working with photography and video and turning them into GIFs and playing with compression. She was doing a lot of work with compression. I was just seeing her GIFs, made me realize, oh, I, I can do something, you know, with the video sources. Uh, because as a video, I, mean, I did experimental film when I was really young and they were absolutely unwatchable. Um, really, like really, really formal and unwatchable. But I was less fascinated with camera angles and shots uh, than I was interested in each separate frame. Mm. I, I loved editing. I was like mesmerized by the 30 frames that made a second. So I um, found myself you know, when, when suddenly, you know, it occurred to me, like made that leap from, you know, my youth doing that to animated gifts. It was like, okay, this is the medium I've been looking for. And because of Sally using video uh, and film in hers and photography, it's like, oh, I've got all this footage that I don't know what to do with. That, you know, it doesn't make sense as video or I don't find satisfying as video. Uh, to, you know, I was able to put them to use and then start shooting all my footage to go to, to become gifts, which made most of that, like, you know, the raw footage is just incomprehensible why I would choose that. Anyone looking going, why would you choose that? Like, I'll make a good gift. <laughs> uh, so that's basically how I got to it. And I was working a lot with my own footage. And then I started getting fascinated with like that whole world and community of gift makers. Right. And there's, it, it's, it's so extreme and over the top and excessive uh, because the looping, you know, it's like these money shots. It's like the pornography, like the, the Pratt falls, the cute animals, it's this, this ridiculous, wonderful world of internet that I absolutely loved. And so I just started collecting them and I was, trying to figure out ways i did exhibit a bunch of like i would just like take the color up desaturate them and, and show them as black and white gifts which was kind of a strange thing to do um but um i i just got distracted by a face a face question privately stop it face um <laughs> i uh, i've totally lost my trap um because I'm looking at my gift while I'm talking. That's really hard. Um, oh, what happened was I got, I found it with social media and, and like Google Plus, which I started really showing a lot of gifts on as well as the blog, was that I found the rectangle really oppressive. It really bothered me. And that's when I started like cutting. Uh, and so that it was more fragmented and it just, it just suddenly clicked everything. Worked and I knew that was the way I wanted to work. Let's switch to another gift. Oh, Faith thought the Royal Agricultural Fair was central to the first gifts. Not quite. <laughs> I used to, but Sally and I would go to the Royal Winter Fair and, you know, video the, video the chickens, the animals. And so I was like, doing a lot of gifts from there. The petting zoos. I love that. <laughs> I, I kind of, um, yeah, I guess I just sort of na naively imagined that the work was, the, the, the source material is all like appropriated, you know? Almost all of it is now. Yeah. But it's, so, but it's, not, it's not all. It's like a little bit of both or... A oh, tiny bit, but really it's such a small percentage now of my own footage. Only because I don't carry my camera around because it's my phone and I, you know, if it rang, I'd have to answer it. I just, it, I prefer to leave my phone in another room, you know, always, whatever room I'm not in is where the phone is. Uh, so I don't really access my camera too often to catch stuff. Well, oh my gosh, I love this, this one, this piece. I love it. I love it so much. Um, oh, thanks. It really sneaks up on you. So, um, but okay. So there's a couple of different questions I have. You mentioned you're not a storyteller, but I find myself searching for narrative or clues to a story slash thesis in each GIF. Is that how you would like people to engage with your work? Would you rather people enjoy them purely visually in a comedic way? Well, no, no. Um, 
our brains love patterns and we look for them all the time. So, I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's pattern recognition. And so, yeah, the act of looking at the gifts and trying whether you want to make a narrative out of that pattern or just recognize it, you know, for its formal qualities. I mean, I, that's how you're going to look at it. And that's in there. I used to do some, I used to do abstract gifts, uh, a lot of them um, basically based from on scans things that I would manipulate in Photoshop and um, record the manipulations. And a lot of that was seeing how far I could take things kind of out of sync and in ways that were kind of jerky or not, not really um, rhythmic mm. and how far I could take it before an internal rhythm showed up, before our brains you know, found a rhythm and it was something I did with myself and, you know, probably, you know, will do it again. But it was an interesting thing just to, to push that uh, kind of uh, uh, cognizance on something. And of course, once you frame something, you know, once you, you know, give something like a framework or structure, you are inviting some kind of like pattern recognition some, or narrative recognition. You just can't help. That's what we do as artists. Definitely narrative. As soon as you decide that something has a beginning and an end, even if it's 30 seconds, then you're started, you're, you're, um, you're inviting like folks to consider narrative, I guess. Yes, you, you are, though. I figure that the loops are so short that to me, it, it's, it's more like a still photograph that's mm. moving than it is like a, a, a movie that's telling the story. Well, and also if the viewer can't really recognize what, where the end is and where the beginning is, yeah. then you're so, then, then that's sort of, so it's, it's playing with both a little bit. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and very immediate gifts respond within minutes to world events. It's funny how quickly the eyes and brain adjust to the jumpy, maybe harsh visual nature of this work. And it becomes very seductive, enchanting, appealing. I always described television as moving wallpaper, your work that takes this idea to a new level. I find them to be very funny. Yeah, they are funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. I mean, it's, it's, it's so strange how people can be so reverent about art. So it's like no humor, unless you're French or something. Then it's like, you know, French, French humor of like, you know, the Duchampian humor of ha ha. You know, can't stand that. I really. I, I I think there's room for you know the goofiness and you know, the absurdity and the what and the how things are so ridiculous um, that you know I I have no problem encompassing in my work and yeah. no problems like of course it's funny <laughs> but the end is not to create comedy otherwise I'd find a better way to do that. <laughs> I don't think art is such a, a you know really great way to do it, but it is, you know, something you know I I do enjoy when people laugh at the work. I also, when I'm looking at work, even if it's not meant to be funny, but I think it's really good and thrilling, I do laugh. Like it, it makes me happy to see something really amazing. I love that. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I, I agree. You know, I think when you're, when, even when you see something that uh, sparks some, like, uh, some realization or a connection that you hadn't really made or thought of before, that becomes like, yeah, it becomes kind of funny um, or, and, it, and just like brings happiness, you know? What attracts you to visuals around excess? And does the use of erotica hold a particular weight or is it more that it's part of a general sense of excess from the internet? I'd say general sense of excess from the internet. Um, and it was quite funny. Someone had asked me to, you know, to do work, a workshop, which I hate. I don't want to do them. And she had suggested, well, it could be like a porn workshop. And I thought of it like initially I thought, oh, that's fun. And then I thought, no, because I don't like other people's porn. I only like my taste in porn. <laughs> and porn sites are generally not funny. 
I mean, they're stupid, but they're not funny. And so when I'm looking at some, I'm looking for porn, I have to specifically look for porn failures. Those are the one, the things I like, you know, that, that in between time, um, when they're not making the movie, I once asked a pornographer, um, you know, what happens to the off cuts, you know, of, 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 you know, what, you know, for a porno movie. And he looked at me like I was a raving idiot. He says, Lorna, there are no off cuts. We use everything. <laughs> like they just don't waste. <laughs> but this is actually one of my faves is this one because it's all like the porn actors are just having fun. <laughs> High fives all around. Yeah. <laughs> Great time. Thumbs ups. <laughs> yeah. It's a party. <laughs> and I, I just found this, I find this one so endearing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we're, we have 15 minutes left. So, folks, if you have questions, um, please. I'm gonna check and make sure that I haven't missed any. No, I don't think I have. Um, I'll just whiz through my backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, just go through your backgrounds. Yes. Um, because yeah, honestly, I have I've asked all my questions through process of like us just talking mm -hmm. um i have like burned through all of them jumping from subject to subject and through uh and also through um just our conversation but i do have a hand raise i am getting there. I'm more, I'm, I'm mute. unmute 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 no they're muted hi lorna, lorna, lorna. hi hi <laughs> Um, sorry, I seem to be getting an echo. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that echo. Very nice. Sorry about that. Uh, I was just wondering, um, so I think, I think there's like an idea sometimes in art that like subtlety um, is the kind of, or like subtlety gets really associated with like sophistication. And what I find really interested about your work is that, uh, like I do think it's very sophisticated in its own way, just in like a, it's, very interesting use of uh, of visual excess, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sort of wondering if you have uh, like a very general question around uh, like what your thoughts around subtlety are, especially since your work is so in your face on the surface. Well, that's the thing. It's in your face because it gives you an end game. I get, seriously, it gives the audience an, a way to enter into the work. It's not passive aggressive. It's not demanding that you have to come all the way to it. There, there's an invitation there and then you know the subtleties the formalities the details um unfold in time which is why it makes you know sense to have them looping and and uh another reason that i don't like doing um uh, reels like when someone asks me into a show and they say we want a whole bunch of gifts but we want them for one monitor i always say no uh, because they are meant as either singular pieces or pieces within an installation and to be looked at um, in their looping na nature. So, um, I mean, the, the, the question about subtlety, when that becomes like the end taste in itself, I, you know, I, I, I find that absolutely ridiculous. And, you know, I'm totally happy to be an absolute barbarian. <laughs> You know, that's, you know, the opposite of um, you know, the subtle, refined taste. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, okay, Carl George, I did, I see you did the Times Square Midnight installation. They were all great. Charles Atlas, Anoni, Kemper Fowler, all great to see on the screen, screens of Times Square. Were you happy with the installation? Well, that was a funny thing to do because in order to do one of those um, Times Square things, you have to present the work you want to show. They don't commission. And oh. which is smart on their part. Yeah. Because they don't get into fights, you know, with an artist who wants to. No, seriously. Um, and um, so I had already, it had been submitted on my behalf um, by my gallerist, Kalani. And um, it was in conjunction with the movie image uh, fair which is a video art fair in new york 
So during the month, the month that that art fair was on, or it's it only on for like a weekend, but you know, the month that it was in uh, was they were going to show a, a pick an artist from the fair. So um, they picked mine, and it was kind of funny because I'd already it had to be something that was submitted to the fair, and. So when they initially picked it, I thought, gee, if I had known, I would have submitted something different. Interestingly, I really, you know, I, I had no sense, and that was the problem with Times Square initially, is you don't have any sense of what your work is gonna look like at that scale. No one can, like it's just, it's so ridiculous and over the top to show there. Um, and you know, in the size of the screens, you know, how, how they're multiplied everywhere. and. Um, so it was very uncomfortable like the opening the first time i saw it because generally you know when you're showing work you you test it you have a way to know and prepare yourself and prepare the work for how it's going to look and this was going in blind and because i was like so damn canadian you know when when it was up i was like i want to apologize oh sorry sorry this is oh, sorry that's all it was sorry it was, it was really weird sorry you came um and then it was like a few days like it was just so overwhelming and as an artist i was like just in this state of shock by it um it wasn't a question of whether i thought it worked or not i was just bewildered it was way too much uh and then i went like two days later uh, with a friend of mine to see it again. And at that point, it was like, oh my God, this is good. <laughs> and it, but it was worked by accident because when you're in Times Square, there's like such a cacophony of images and the advertisements and, and the movie uh, clips and things like that, that the stuff that works, the art pieces that work the best are things that don't compete with it, are things that are brightly colored, and not as detailed and graphic, like strong graphics really, really work. And the piece that was submitted, you know, was graphically really strong and really simple. So when it, because they don't take all the screens, like it's not like 400 screens, um, it's about 100 screens, the different sizes. And so you're playing along with the advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, you get like, you know, the NASDAQ building and things like that, that's cool. But it's it's like all sorts of different um devices for playback and so i mean if you if all the screens had gone to my piece it would kind of look fascist and weird <laughs> but the fact that okay <laughs> you, oh, it's like oh lenny riefenstahl's dream has come through um but because it wasn't that way um i could see how it worked and someone had pointed out to me something i didn't see at first was that what happened when the piece came on was that it changed the light there was enough um big screens playing it that that golden yellow yeah. like reflected on everything which made it you know kind of like special it shone in a way and but it, i never like, i wish i could say yes i planned that because i'm so brilliant i hadn't it was just the happiest accident I mean, perhaps like the people during it, like no, have had enough experience to know what works in that space and what doesn't. Because some stuff doesn't work. Right. You know, if it's too detailed, it's just you can get lost and then it looks like advertising. I was looking at, I think Fulton Station has in New York has a um, video art project and they have these fabulous screens and all different shapes and panoramics. And You've got to be like, I want to do one. And it's kind of interesting because with, with, you know, a taste towards like, they seem to have a taste towards like 3D rendering in there, like for the artworks. And what happens is it's really hard to tell when it's advertising and when it's the artwork coming in. Like there, there, there's stuff I've seen at moments of going, is this the art or is this just more advertising? It's like, it's, oh. it's not. And, and that's, that's a trick to differentiate your work, unless you mean to blend in and subvert it in some way. But, you know, obviously I'm not blending in. That must have been so surreal to see your work uh, juxtaposed with these like gigantic advertisements as well. Well, after the first night, yeah, I think I, I went to New York every weekend. 
stuff for that month. <laughs> We'd come, you know, take different people to see it, you know, and, and, and it was great. It was exciting. Oh, I love that. Oh, there's another good question. Three minutes. Yeah, Times Square is fascist. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Barbara Kruger is great. Yeah, what she does with that blur of art and advertising. Um, I have a, I have one more question. I, I guess in your work too, I mean, there's so, such a, fo there's focus as well on, you know, the, like, you know, lower quality in video and, you know, there's like less information. None of the video is like really, really crisp, high quality, you know, right. and it, um, it definitely, it contributes to the, to the medium for sure. But I, I'm guessing is that, um, of, is that like important to you? Like, are you interested in like media theory or um, thinking about, you know, what low quality images mean and th things like that, I guess. Well, I mean, part of like the fact that they're low quality image is because that's what's available to me online. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, as I, I could shoot, you know, better images, you know, in, with my camera. And use that but it it was never important it i could make it formally work by cutting things out so no matter how kind of like grisly um uh, the, the image quality was i always had these sharp edges uh yeah. which you know works the eye needs that like you know no it's you're not i can i can do it you know, like a work full of out of focus gifts and still make it work because i've got the sharp Mm. And so formally, it's not an issue. Um, now there's that the essay on uh, poor images. Um, gosh, I forgot her yeah. name now. Ito um, Stero, Stero. Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and someone had asked me once if I had, um, if she was a influence. And I mean, she the essay wasn't an influence because I was already doing what I was doing before I read the influence before I read the essay. But the essay actually influences how it's influential in that it influences how people will look at my work and accept it. That oh yeah, it's poor. Like she's, it's I'm doing it on purpose. Mm. And that's you know, of course, if you do something a million times, eventually people figure out you, you're doing it because you meant to. <laughs> but <laughs> oh yeah, um, that's. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. And I don't know, like that essay has become so prevalent in, in terms of um, like internet art, digital art, you know, you learn it, I, I learned it in art school, you know, and so you think of it as being this thing that like everybody is kind of, has at least like read or is reacting to or something, but uh you know, she was observing what was, you know, happening with art. I mean, one thing I found interesting with early net art and how all the pages always look so cluttered and bad. I mean, if you've ever seen Yvette's bridal page. I haven't. Google it, Yvette. It <laughs> is genius. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bridal shop and it is the most zany design you'll ever see in your life and it's an absolute joy and it, she's serious this was this was i don't think the shop exists anymore but it was so absurd in just the colors the text the mess of it it's it, it, it's a wonder and one thing i noticed with early net art people loved that artists really rejected the idea of design or mastery they didn't want to look like designers, like very clear. You want to differentiate yourself from being a good web designer. Right. <laughs> and so it's like a lot of like, you know, the, the use of, of, you know, the, what, you know, do you think of as bad advertising or bad design, you know, becomes very central to the look of, of the work. Why do you think that is? Oh, stop, really? Like, I mean, no, it, it's, it's like, this is art. Uh, right. it's not art. We're not sure. <laughs> We're not committed. <laughs> Secretly, we believe it's art. And if you believe it too, that's great. But, you know, we'll pretend you don't think it's art. <laughs> but it is, if you give me a show in a gallery. Like, 
it's that kind of garbage thinking. Well, that becomes kind of like a, I, I like the idea of art being a little bit, I don't know about contentious, but, um, you know, you draw your own conclusions, I guess. Um, okay, we're at the three minute mark. Um, do folks have any more last minute questions? Um, one more comment that says, because it is the definition of camp is why, <laughs> which is, that's. I think that was in reference to Times Square. <laughs> oh, oh, I see, I saw it, I see. I got you. Um, okay, so yeah, I guess we're, we're gonna wrap it up. Um, thank you so much, Lorna, for, for coming and having this conversation with me. It was really such a pleasure to talk with you um, and to sort of explore your work um, through the Zoom background. We love, we love that. My retrospective is going to be on Zoom. <laughs> Why not? I love the idea of a retrospective with the artist like imposed into all of the, all of the work. Like that seems, that's great. <laughs> One last bit of porn. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you so much um, for doing this and for meeting with us and uh, thank you everybody so much for coming to Option Plus Shift with Lorna Mills. Hi Faith. <laughs> <laughs>